Um, so what we're going to talk about first is the data analysis and periodic properties activity. That's the first thing that we're going to go over here. And um, this one has a lot of learning objectives that go with it, which should tell you that it's kind of important. Okay? I'm going to try to get through at least this in the 717 to 75 practice problems today in class because that's what you actually have a quiz over on Monday. So we need to talk about those as much as possible. Um, I may not talk about all of each of them, but I'll at least introduce it so that you know what's going on. Um, so there's a website here, okay? And uh, I actually like this website because it basically just gives you some uh, PES data. And so we're going to practice this. So what it's telling us to do, click on the hydrogen square so you can see how the data is actually displayed on the graph. Um, I got way too many tabs open here. So if you click on this, you can see there's your PES data. Now this, again, this is kind of a cartoonish version of what you would actually see, okay? Um, but it's a little bit simpler to read than, than the actual data. Um, and so what you can see there is uh, the relative number of electrons is on the y-axis, and there's one, okay? They actually label it at the top of the peak as well, which is nice. Um, that's what you would expect from hydrogen, right? Because it only has one electron, okay? And so it's telling you 1.31. Now, the, the one complaint that I have about this is they're not telling you the units. I don't know why they don't tell you the units for this. Um, so I actually did include that on the, the activity here, okay? It's megajoules per mole, all right? Um, which we don't usually talk about megajoules, but... Uh, if you are going to make a mole of electrons leave, it's going to take a lot of energy, okay? Um, so, but usually we're just thinking about one electron leaving or that sort of thing, so. Um, all right. So the number below the peak is the binding energy. Again, that's in megajoules per mole. The binding energy is roughly equivalent to the ionization energy. Um, and remember how we find that, okay? So you're taking the energy of the photon, which is Planck's constant times. That's, I probably should have actually put a Greek letter nu there. That's supposed to be a nu, not a V. Um, minus the kinetic energy of the electron when it hits the detector. That's going to give us the binding energy, okay? The number above the peak is how many electrons are hitting at that particular energy, okay? Now, again, when you do this in an actual real life setting, you're going to be doing this to a large, large sample of atoms, so you're going to have a lot more than just one electron hitting the detector, right? So that's the relative number, okay? Um, now it says click the dual button. We'll activate one is click to choose hydrogen. So we'll do that. Dual button, activate one, we'll click hydrogen, and then the other one Basically, what dual allows you to do is compare a couple of them, and then we're going to choose helium for the other one on this. And then click activate two, and you guys can do this at home too. Um, so notice uh, just a couple of things here. I can't remember exactly what I, you know what? Well, I guess I'll keep doing it this way, because that way you can follow along if you're watching the video. Um, yeah, I suppose I could. Maybe, yeah, let's see how that works if I put them side by side. Well, that didn't get much smaller. I know. Oh, that's actually kind of worked well. I don't know. Is that going to be a little hard to read? I'm not sure if that's going to work. I'll just... Well, that's, that's true, I guess. That way I don't have to... Okay. So we'll just keep this open. and Now I can go back and forth without having to go to the bottom menu. All right. So um, you can compare the two. And the questions we want to answer here, how does the binding energy for the helium compare to the binding energy for the hydrogen electron? And then the question is, why does this difference exist? Yeah, I might even stretch this one out, too, because that's a little small. Okay, so which one has the higher binding energy? 
Yeah, the helium, okay? So why does this difference exist? Why does it take more energy to pull the electrons off of helium than it does to pull the electron off of hydrogen? Okay, now, I want to be, again, I want to be very careful here about the way that we, because I don't know how some of you have been taught this particular concept, okay? But I know a lot of chemistry teachers like to talk about, um, oh, because it wants a full outer energy level, right? Okay, so the helium electrons, they're just holding on for dear life because they're like, no, we're in a full energy level. Don't take us away. Okay, electrons don't do that. They don't have personality, all right? So it's not like the helium atom is saying, oh, I'm stable. Don't take my electrons, okay? The reason it's stable is because the reason it's able to hold on to its electrons more tightly is because there are two protons in the helium nucleus. There's only one proton in the hydrogen nucleus, okay? So because they are, these electrons are in the same energy level, they're both in the, the 1s orbital, right? So they're approximately the same distance away from the nucleus, so the only thing that's different is the nuclear charge on helium is higher, okay? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so then why is the peak twice as high for helium when compared with hydrogen? to make sure we kind of understand the graph here. Why is the peak twice as high? Because there's two electrons there, okay? That's not, the, the size of the peak in this particular activity is not telling you anything about the energy, okay? That's going to be the number underneath and where it falls on this scale left to right, okay? That's what's going to tell you the energy. The size of the peak just tells you how many electrons there are in that particular peak, all right? Okay, next. What can this data tell us about the electron configurations of both hydrogen and helium? Any thoughts on this one? <coughs> I mean, for one thing, it tells us how many electrons there are, right? And it should kind of give us a sense of the fact that, okay, there's, there's only one electron in hydrogen. There's two electrons in helium, but they're probably both in the same orbital because they both have the same energy, right? So it makes sense that our, you know, this would be 1s1 for the hydrogen and this would be 1s2 for the helium. They're both in the same orbital, okay? Essentially, it tells you the orbital. So what I want you to do as we go through this is kind of start to get a sense of how this photoelectron spectroscopy data really does verify the model of the atom that we have developed, okay? Not we. I had nothing to do with it. All right. Um, now click activate one again, choose lithium. Okay, so now we're just, uh, now we're looking at lithium and helium. So back over here, we do lithium. Okay, now the question we want to answer, why does lithium have two peaks while helium only has one? Okay, this must correspond to two orbitals, right? Okay. In other words, the electrons must be um, in different energy levels. Okay, you can also kind of think of it as they must be different relative distances from the nucleus. Okay, you have to be a little careful with that. Um, but the lithium must have an electron in a different energy level, okay? So that's kind of the idea there. Um, the more peaks you have, the more orbitals these electrons are in. Um, look at the lithium graph, which shell corresponds to the peak with an energy of 0.52 millijoules per mole. Is it the valence shell or the inner shell? So this one right here, the 0.52, do you think that's the valence, the outer shell electron that's leaving? Or do you think that's the inner shell electron? That's probably the outer or the valence shell, right? Now, how do you know that? Because it's to pull off that valence electron. Okay, right. So, and actually it says two ways that you know this, okay? So one way is probably the best way. It's because um, this is a lower amount of energy it takes to pull it away from the nucleus. It makes sense that would be the valence electron. The other reason we know this is lithium has three electrons, 
if the first two are in the 1s orbital, that's probably this peak right here with the two electrons, and then the peak that only has one electron is probably the one valence electron that, that we know lithium has. Okay. Although well, that's slightly circular reasoning, I suppose. We're assuming I'm assuming a knowledge of the electron configuration for that second reason. <laughs> okay, why does it take so much more energy to remove an electron from lithium's first shell? We kind of talked about this the other day. Um, <coughs> okay, so we decided the 6.26 peak over here on lithium, that's the inner shell um, electrons, okay? So the question is, why is it so much harder to remove the inner shell electrons from lithium than it is to remove them from the helium? Okay, so the lithium has three protons instead of just two, right? So because the lithium has more protons, it can hold those inner electrons uh, even more tightly, okay? There's a greater force there. Um, and so it's harder to pull them off. And it's, it's saying to include Coulomb's law in your explanation. So we've kind of been talking about Coulomb's law. Um, but basically what we're talking about here is the difference in the Qs, right? Okay, so the charge on the helium, if we make the, the protons Q1 there in the Coulomb's law, Q1 would be smaller for helium than it would be for lithium because lithium has more protons. <coughs> okay. Uh, D, could the PES help us make any conclusions about the size of the atoms? If not, why not? And if so, how? Do you think we could make any sort of conclusions about the size of the atoms looking at this data? Yeah, including the electrons. Um, okay, so it, it seems like, looking from this data, and it's a little bit of a jump, so it's kind of like, yeah, maybe we could, maybe we couldn't. Um, but knowing what we already know about um, periodic trends, we probably could come to some conclusion about which one is bigger, right? Um, probably the lithium is bigger because it's got two peaks, right? So if it's got the two peaks, that probably means that one of them is a little bit further from the nucleus, okay? And the one that's a little bit further from the nucleus is probably the one that it takes a little less energy to pull the electron away from the atom. That wasn't very clear what I just said. Um, because it takes less energy to pull away the, the one electron that's in the 0.52 peak here on lithium, we could probably conclude that one's further away from the nucleus. Okay. <coughs> All right. Could the PES help us make conclusions about the electron affinities of the atoms? Well, we kind of got to talk about what electron affinity is first. And I'll just mention this because I don't know that they're going to make a big deal about this on the AP exam. I think the trends that they're really looking for are ionization energy, electronegativity, and uh, size. Okay. But just in case, electron affinity is how much energy, it's the exact opposite of ionization energy. Okay. It's how much energy will get released if you give an electron to an atom. Okay. So can we really make any conclusions about electron affinities by looking at this? Probably not without knowing something already about the orbitals, right? I mean, I'm not sure that this is going to necessarily tell us um, which one of these is, is going to be more likely to, to gain an electron, unless we already know, well, because helium has a completely full 1s orbital, it's going to be hard to get, you know, Helium's not going to want another electron, essentially. Um, so prob probably not on that one, okay? All right. Activate two, and this time we're going to choose boron. Um, this is where it starts to get a little more interesting, I think. <coughs> All right. So we've got boron. Hmm. Boron appears to have three peaks. And... 
what I what I don't want to confuse you here, they're not putting these on different. These aren't like energy levels or anything like that. Okay, they just ran out of room, right? So this is zero to ten, and this is ten to a hundred on the the megajoule scale. Okay, uh, so you also kind of have to realize these are scaled differently, which is a little tricky. Okay, but. I just don't want you thinking, oh, they're showing the different energy levels here. That's not what they're showing. They just ran out of room on the 0 to 10, so they had to extend it. Um, so the question's here. Oops. How many electrons does boron have in its valence shell? <coughs> in its valence shell. This is kind of tricky. Okay. It's got how many total electrons here? It's got five total electrons, okay? Um, and it's hard to see from here, but how many do we know boron has in it? Looking on the periodic table. It has three, right? Okay, do you guys see that right here? One, two, three. Valence, yeah. Yep. Okay, so... Oh, where are the valence electrons? And th that's why I'm saying don't look at these, right? Because if you look at this as, a, as though it were an energy level, you would be like, oh, it's two, right? But that's not what this is showing. This is just a continuation of this line. You have to imagine that this line is really just laid over here on the right side, okay? Um, so... <coughs> um, which peaks do you think correspond with the valence electrons, and how do you know? Do we think the bottom two peaks correspond with the valence electrons? Okay, and why do we think the bottom two peaks correspond with the valence electrons? It takes less energy to get them to leave the atom, right? Okay, and that's the valence electrons. It's going to be easier to pull them off than it is the inner or the core electrons, all right? So these are the core electrons on boron. All right. Now notice we're getting quite a bit higher in energy here. To pull those core electrons away, it's taking quite a bit more energy. And the reason for that is boron has five protons. Okay. So the, the higher that nuclear charge gets, the, the more energy it takes to pull those um, inner electrons off. Okay. All right. So uh, why is the binding energy, oh, we just talked about that. Why is the binding energy for boron's first electron, oh, no, we didn't talk about this, sorry. Why is the binding energy for boron's first electron, and, and when I say first electron, that was phrased badly. Um, what I mean is the first valence electron that gets taken away, okay? Um, this one that says 0.8 down here, okay? Why is it easier to pull that electron off than it is to pull off the next two? Okay. So it's just because boron says, oh, wait a second, I'm already positive now. I don't want to be even more positive. Is it because of that? Okay. What's that? Okay. Might have something to do with that. Um. Okay, there you go. And, and so that's, that's where this really does show us good data that, hey, this whole orbital thing, we're really on the right track with the orbital thing, right? Because what this is showing is this, this point eight here, probably that's the electron coming from the 2p orbital, right? Okay, and that 2p orbital has a little bit higher energy which roughly corresponds to a little bit greater distance from the nucleus, okay? And if that's the case, it's easier to pull off that 2p electron than it is to pull off the two electrons that are in the 2s orbital. Does that make sense? I mean, I can kind of try to draw pictures here. Huh. Oops, cheerio challenge. That would be nice, wouldn't it? I just messed everything up. Um, okay, I think we're good. So you've got a um, you've got a boron, right? 
And he's just really dumb. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, alright. So, and then I, I can't, I can't, I can't draw this three dimensionally, so, um, sorry. But let's say that's your 1s orbital for boron right there, okay? And then your 2s orbital, what you really have to imagine here is that these are spheres, overlapping spheres. The 1s is smaller than the 2s, okay? And then you've got a 2p orbital that has an electron in it that, that maybe kind of looks like um, this, okay? Um, a little bit higher in energy. So I, I'm sorry. I know that I knew this was going to be bad when I first drew it. All right, but um, the idea here is this 0 0.80 right here is the electron that's coming from the p orbital. Okay, and um, that one's just a little bit easier to to get to leave. Okay, because again, it corresponds to a little bit higher energy, so which roughly corresponds to a little bit further from the nucleus. Okay, which means that that the boron nucleus has a little bit less tight of a hold on that on that electron, okay? But if we were just going with Bohr's atomic model here, uh, see, I set it down. I shouldn't have done that. If we were just going with Bohr's atomic model, Bohr didn't talk about orbitals. He just talked about orbits, right? So according to Bohr, we've got two electrons here, and then in boron, we've got one, two, three electrons here. And there should be no difference in the energy it takes to get any of these three to leave, right? According to the Bohr model of the atom. But because there is a difference, the quantum model is probably more correct than the Bohr model. You see how that works? Okay. So this data kind of shows us, oh, we need to revise our models just a little bit. What? Okay. <laughs> It's an early Halloween miracle. All right, where is my... Okay, there we go. Um, well, okay, I, see, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, does the graph for boron help to verify the idea of orbitals? So we just talked about that, okay? All right, switch back to mono under the spectra. Now click on NA. Um, so if we're going to go back to mono here, Sorry, you're not getting to do this. <coughs> um, I don't know why you'd ever want mono. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> All right. Um, that's just as good as any of mine have been, so I should have probably laughed at it. I get um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so don't let the fact there are three levels on the graph throw you. Again, that's just an extension because now we're going out to 500. Uh, megajoules up here, okay? Because these two electrons up here, which which electrons are they in the sodium? Those are the 1s electrons, right? Those are the very inner electrons. And because sodium, now we're up to 11 protons in the nucleus, it takes a lot of energy to pull those off, okay? And so now maybe you're starting to see why we need x-rays to really see all of this, because you need something with a lot of energy. Um, in order to be able to get those electrons off of the atoms. All right. Uh, use the graph to write the electron configuration for sodium. Okay. So if you're writing an electron configuration from one of these, you need to start with the highest energy, right, and work your way down to the lowest energy when you're doing the electron configuration. Okay. Um, now, you guys know how to do this from the periodic table already, but this is just another way to do it, and I, I like how this all connects. So um, this is our 1s2 up here, right? Um, these two peaks right here, <coughs> the next highest energy would correspond to our 2s2, okay? What are those next six electrons there? Those are all the two p's, right? Okay, which... Apparently, again, it kind of confirms our idea about the orbitals, that those three p orbitals all have basically the same energy to them, okay? They're oriented in different directions in space, but they all pretty much have the same energy, okay? And then we've got one electron out here that would correspond to the 3s1. See how that works? Okay. I have to erase this. 
is not well thought out. Whoops. Oh, no. Did I just close it? Ooh, I panicked for a second. Alright. So, repeat number five, except this time do it for SC. Okay, so now we're going to look at SC. Why am I doing it this way again? <laughs> oh, Alright. Now we've got SC. Now that's a little more complicated, but we can do this. This is not hard now that we know the trick. <laughs> okay, so 1s2, right? 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, that seems to be working, 3p6, hmm, well, what is this? <laughs> This must be the 4S2 right here, and then the 3D1. Now, this is kind of interesting, all right? Um, we're not going to get too much into the whole transition metal idea, except for, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> th this is interesting because you can kind of look at this. I, I mentioned this briefly last year. I don't know if you even remember me mentioning it. Um, when the transition metals form ions, uh, okay, tell you what, I don't even need to tell you this. You can look based on the data. Uh, when the transition metals form ions, which electrons do you think they lose first? Which ones, which electrons there have the lowest energy? The four S's, right? Okay. So you see how it's probably the four S's that are going to get lost first because it takes a little less energy for those to be pulled off of the atom. Okay, that goes for pretty much any transition metal. Okay, any transition metal, it's going to lose its S electrons first, and then any additional electrons that it might lose to form an ion, it's going to lose from the d orbitals. Okay, so SC, um, you could maybe take a guess at the two most common charges that SC would form. Maybe a two plus and a three plus. That kind of makes sense, based on the way that it would lose its electrons, okay? All right. Back to this. <coughs> um, okay, that's, man, I'm just so in sync with myself here. It's amazing. Like uh, <laughs> yeah, like the band. All right, examine the data for all the elements on this website. Do these data support the current arrangement of the periodic table? What do you think the answer to that's probably going to be? Yeah. <laughs> probably so, or we would have changed the periodic table by now, right? Okay. Um, we're not going to do all of that, because, and you can take time to look at that if you want to. Um, first ionization energies of AS and SE are 0.947 and 0.941, respectively. Rationalize these values in terms of electron configurations and Coulomb's law. Um, are AS and SE even on here, or did I kind of go off of this now? Okay. So now we're just talking, hopefully at this point you, you have enough background to be able to start talking about um, why these different things have different ionization energies, okay? So if you look at where AS and SE are, <coughs> yeah, I know that, that sounded awkward. Um, they're right next to each other on the periodic table, right? One's 33 and one's 34. Um, so the first ionization energy for AS is 0.947. First ionization energy for uh, SE is 0.941. Hmm. It's lower. This is a little tricky. Can we come up with any reason why uh, it might be easier to take the first electron away from selenium uh, than it would be from... Um, I forgot what AS is. No. Is it arsenic? Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I was thinking of AT down there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking AS was astatanium, but that's AT. AS is arsenic. Sorry. Um, so, can we think of any, any reason why there might be that weird exception to the ionization rule? Because typically, when we go from left to right, the ionization energies get higher. Right? First ionization energies? Yeah, we said it's a metal or a non-metal versus a metal. 
Okay, not necessarily related to the nonmetal metalloid thing, although I mean that does have to do with the ionization energy, right? Um, Okay, and this, this is where you've got to be thinking about orbitals, right? Okay, so if you draw the orbital diagram for these, a lot of times that can help you with this, this sort of thing. I'm just going to draw the, uh, the outer P electron, so we're in the 4P orbitals at that point, okay? Well, this is just strange. Um, so you've got your 4P orbitals here, and the only difference between AS and SE, this is the electron configuration for AS, okay? <coughs> Um, <laughs> this is the electron configuration for AS and the 4P orbitals. For SE, when we have one more electron here, it's, it's going to be a paired electron, okay? Um, having half-filled orbitals is actually a fairly stable configuration. It's not as stable as having completely full orbitals, okay? But the half-filled orbitals is, is a decently stable configuration. So adding that one extra electron in there, um, that one's not that difficult to remove. It's a little bit easier to remove than um, the this electron for AS because you have this half-filled kind of stable energy state, right? Um, I don't know why I threw that question in where I threw it in. It's kind of, kind of out of place. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, all right. Go back to dual, put the diagram for carbon on the left and the diagram for silicon on the right. Based on the data you see there, give an argument for and an argument against the following statement. SiO2 is a good replacement for CO2 if CO2 is not available. <laughs> yeah, good question. We've got, we've got plenty of CO2, don't we? All right, but uh, let's, just, let's just think about that. So carbon and SiO2. Um, here, i got to go back to dual mode. And I need to actually, oh, darn it. Wow, it didn't go away. The eraser does do it. It does, the eraser does do it sometimes. I don't know. Huh. Okay, all right. So, uh, first one here it said was carbon, right? And the other one was silicon. <laughs> I get nervous when I make these videos. Um, all right, so what's an argument for the idea that SiO2 would be a good replacement for CO2. It has the same number of valence electrons, right? So it seems like it might react with oxygen in approximately the same way, okay? Um, any arguments that you can see against silicon being a good replacement? What's that? Okay, yeah, I mean, essentially, it's just, it's a quite a bit larger atom, right? It's got an extra set, uh, it's got an extra energy level there, okay? But what I'm saying is, it turns out, and we're going to come back to this a little bit later, carbon dioxide, um, carbon is small enough that it will form double bonds fairly easily. Silicon is a larger atom, so it doesn't necessarily like to form double bonds. Uh, this is one of the major reasons why we were probably carbon-based life forms as opposed to silicon-based life forms, okay? Because of the ability of carbon to form double and triple bonds. It's kind of an interesting thing. So SiO2 actually is a, uh, it's structured completely differently because it's not, the silicon does not double bond to the oxygens, it just single bonds to the oxygens, okay? So not, not that you would know that yet, but it's just kind of an interesting little thing that, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, SiO2, no, it's, it's, it's very common, but it, structurally it's very different than CO2. It's actually a solid at room temperature. Carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature, and it has to do with the way that the, the covalent network forms with SiO2. So, like I said, we will get to that a little bit later in the year, okay? Just kind of setting you up for that one. All right, so that's that. I better stop this video before it gets too long, and then we'll, we'll do another one while I'm going over the practice problems.